Steve Miller. I'm going to be telling you uh, a little bit about the work that myself and Joshua Knowles have been doing on the evolution of cooperation in networks. Uh, can I just check that everyone can hear me? Yep. Thanks. So uh, this is what I'm going to go through during my talk. I'm going to mention cooperation in the real world with respect to evolution. I'm going to talk a little bit about some game theory aspects. I'm going to mention some existing research which we've based our work on. Uh, and then I'm going to introduce our, I'm going to describe our model and then pre present some results. If there's some time, I'll do a little postscript at the end. If not, then not. So um, here's some examples of cooperation in the real world. Uh, this is monkeys preening each other to remove ticks in a, a kind of reciprocal cooperative behaviour. This shows meerkats standing sentinel whilst other members of the community are feeding. Honeybees perform the waggle dance when they get back to the hive to show the location of a food source that they found to other bees. Uh, bacteria hunt in packs, they forage collectively and they cooperate to build shelters. Um, so um, it's easy to explain how monkeys have got the intelligence to, uh, to the higher primates have got the intelligence to rationalise how this behaviour is in their best interest. It's a lot harder to explain why bacteria might adopt the same cooperative evolutionary behaviour. So I'm going to say there's a, there's a contradiction between the, the basic understanding of natural selection in the form of competition versus cooperation. And you can illustrate, I'm going to illustrate this by this example of how geese have this cooperative behaviour which is flying in a V formation. So the geese behind the leader fly in a slipstream which reduces the, the energy that it takes to fly. So they, they need less energy so they consume less food, so, so it's, a, it's, it's an advantage to them. However, the leader tired of being at the front. So they take it in turns to each take a little time at the front. So you have to ask yourself then, what happens when you have a goose that's a cheat? It's just going to sit at the back, it's going to gain all of the benefits of uh, this like flying in the slipstream, but it's not going to pay the cost by taking its time at the front. So it's going to have a marginal gain in fitness. And over generations, this marginal gain in fitness will result in the perpetuation of that cheat, that defective behaviour. So natural selection says that that behaviour should become the dominant behaviour and cooperation should become extinguished. However, in the real world, this doesn't happen. We see examples of cooperation and we believe that this is due to enabling mechanisms. So here's five commonly discussed enabling mechanisms. And I am particularly interested in network reciprocity. The reason that I'm interested in that is all of these, well not all of them, but a lot of these other um, mechanisms have constraints or assumptions that, that tie them very, very specifically to particular scenarios. Whereas you can make this sort of argument that all organisms live in some form of network. That may not necessarily be social. So, some game theory stuff now. The prisoner's dilemma is like a fundamental of game theory. It's originally formulated as uh, two partners in crime are arrested, they're put into separate cells in a police station, and they're, they're being coerced into turning evidence against their partner in crime in order to gain a reduced sentence. And this idea is now represented sort of more commonly in this mathematical framework where you have a payoff matrix, and there's two players, and they each have to make a choice to cooperate or defect. The players make these choices synchronously and they can't discuss what they're going to do with their neighbour, then sorry, their opponent. So you look at this, uh, you look at this payoff matrix and you think, how would I rationally, how would I rationally analyse this matrix to make sure that I get that highest score that I possibly can? So if we assume that my opponent is going to cooperate, then if I cooperate, I get a score of three. If I defect, I get a score of five. So it makes sense for me to defect. Let's assume that my opponent is going to defect, and then if I cooperate, I get a score of zero. If I defect, I get a score of one. So it makes sense for me to defect and get a score of one. The conclusion is it's better for me to defect. And we've just shown that in both cases, whatever my opponent does, it's better for me to defect. The game is symmetrical, so my opponent will come to the same conclusion. And uh, the dilemma then is that this, this rational decision-making process leads both players to defect. They get one, one point each, but if they cooperated, they would have achieved a higher score. Sometimes presented as the conflict between how the choices of an individual uh, aren't in the best interests of the sort of the decisions that would be made collectively by the group. 
So now on to how we're going to use this in simulations. We use an evolutionary game theoretic approach. This means that we're no longer having a rational decision making process. Evolution is in charge of deciding which strategies get used and perpetuated. We've got simple agents with no memory, no recognition, no planning. So this is going back to the idea of how we explain cooperation in things like bacteria. They're playing one-shot prisoner's dilemma with their neighbours to accumulate payoffs. Their fitness is a result of all of those payoffs they get from all of the games they play with all of the neighbours. And the behaviours that increase fitness the most are then preferentially passed on to the next generation. There's two strategies, cooperate or defect. So it's a, it's a simple scenario. Two key points then for these kind of simulations. The first is that in a well-mixed population or an even mixed population, cooperation does not survive. And this is mathematically demonstrable as well. And the second one is that cooperators achieve higher scores by playing against other cooperators, which you can see from this re-presentation of the payoff matrix. So um, with, these, with these three pieces of research now that I'm going to talk about, these all move us away from the scenario of an evil in its population. So the first piece of work was in static lattices, where Novak and May, 1992, they took agents, and instead of having this even mixing, they, they positioned them at locations in a spatial network. And they found that doing this with an evolutionary simulation allowed cooperators to cluster and thus increase their scores. The next piece of work, Santos and Pacino in 2006, developed this idea further by using networks rather than lattices. And they used four different types of networks. They used regular, random, uh, small world and scale free, an increasing order of heterogeneity, and they found that heterogeneity of degree promoted the evolution of cooperation. And just quickly, what I mean by that, by that term heterogeneity, the degree is the number of connections, the number of friends that I have. So a scale free network has got a, a, a small number of nodes that have got thousands and thousands of connections, and an awful lot of nodes that have just got one or two connections. So you get this long tail graph, whereas a random network has got maybe an average of four or five connections per node, some are two and some are three, so the range is much smaller. The range on a scale free graph is in theory infinite and in practical terms it's huge. So the final piece of research is uh, the work of Poncella who took the static network idea and turned it into a dynamic network and she grew networks using a process of preferential attachment and instead of a preferential attachment system where she was connecting to nodes of higher degree, she used preferential attachment connecting to nodes that were fitter. So it's, it's linking fitness of the agents and their behaviour to the actual structure of the network. So uh, going back to the two key points that I made earlier, in a wellness, popu in a wellness population cooperation doesn't survive, but uh, we see that this introduction of spatial structures changes this. And I said that cooperators use it, benefited most by playing against other cooperators. And being able to really distribute over these spatial structures allows them to increase their fitness. So um, there's, been these, there's been a lot of research since these papers uh, focusing on heterogeneity in networks and how it promotes cooperation. And scale free networks are uh, highly heterogeneous. So, so obviously there's a lot of emphasis on those. So with that in mind, it's worth making a few comments about scale-free networks. So in the initial excitement in the scientific literature about scale-free networks, networks were claimed back then to be scale-free and subsequently been found not to be. It's also very difficult to say for sure that a network is scale-free. You typically in the real world have a limited range of orders of magnitude at which you can assess uh, the, you know, linearity in log log terms. You have noise present, which, which compounds that difficulty, and scale-free uh, distributions can look quite similar to log normal or stretched exponential, or even under very limited ranges, can look quite similar to exponential graphs. Uh, Close et al. have said that claims of scale-freeness are often hypothesized rather than demonstrated. And the other important thing is that there isn't a single undenying explanation for preferential attachment. For each situation where you have preferential attachment occurring, you have to have an explanation which relates to that particular situation or that, sorry, that particular situation. So I'm going to move on and tell you a bit about our model now. Our model doesn't use preferential attachment, it uses random attachment. 
as I've said, there's been a lot of work on heterogeneity networks and a lot of work on, particularly then, on scale-free networks as a result. And people tend to categorise networks, talk about scale-free networks, and then use random, random networks as like a baseline. But it's really important to remember that a, a network that is formed by a random attachment of nodes over time doesn't create a random network. A random network has a Poisson distribution. A network that's created over time by the random addition of new nodes has an exponential distribution. This model also eliminates any ideas of global noise. So we're going back to this idea that it, it might be analogous to bacteria. There's four steps in the model. So uh, the agents play prisoner's dilemma to determine fitnesses. They have a strategy updating process where fitter strategies displace those that are less fit. Then the network is grown by the addition of new nodes, and then nodes are removed, and the nodes that are removed are those that are least fit in a, in a probabilistic manner. And when I'm talking about fluctuation, which I'm, I'm going to be doing shortly, this is what I mean, growing and then removing nodes. So the original model by Poncella showed growth up to a maximum number of nodes and then stays, uh, you know, a fixed structure. Whereas this model that I'm going to talk about reaches the maximum and then it oscillates around that by deletion and then growth. In both of these, strategy updating continues throughout the entire simulation. So, um, oh, these are the these are, sorry, these are the equations for each of these steps. So, this shows that the strategy of a neighbor node displacing a node of interest is given by the difference in fitness between the nodes relative to an overall maximum possible difference in fitness. And I want to show, to highlight the growth of the network. I've said we're growing by random attachment. This is the preferential attachment equation. And you can see from this that any newcomer to a network that's going to attach to an existing node in a network has to know the total number of nodes in the network, the population size if you like, and it also has to know the fitness of all of the other members of the population, which is a, an unrealistic expectation. Um, so here are some results. Um, these, this is uh, the evolutionary preferential attachment model. This is our model of fluctuation and uh, the growth is by random chronological attachment. Uh, these are uh, simulations over generations, and this shows a fraction of cooperators present. So in the original evolutionary preferential attachment model, after 2,000 generations, you've got 10 replicates here, some are getting up to 50% of the population cooperators. And this model of ours seems to show more consistency and you achieve higher levels of cooperation. I'm now going to show you the degree distributions at the end of the simulation. So um, this is for the, the evolutionary preferential attachment model. You can see there's high heterogeneity there. And this is our model. And you can see low, low heterogeneity in the form of a, a smaller range of degree values. This is probably beyond scale three. This is moving more towards like a winner take all star type network. So in theory, scale, the, the idea of heterogeneity promoting cooperation says this should have higher levels of cooperation. But there's more to it than that. Strategies need to assort, self-assort, and it, is, it seems that this gets missed sometimes in some of the literature. So with this model, it seems that the network becomes fixed in such a way that strategies can't assort to their full potential in order to achieve the high levels of cooperation. Um, quickly, the weak prisoner's dilemma is a reformulation of the original prisoner's death dilemma in a single parameter, just to make it easier to, uh, to, to, to uh, test different <coughs> so I'll, I'll, I'll illustrate this better in a minute. The B value, which, which it boils down to, represents the temptation to defect, and increasing the temptation to defect leads to reduced cooperation. So here we increase the temptation to defect, this is the B value, and we see cooperation reduce. And these results show our minimal model of growth and fluctuation and uh, they compare it to the evolutionary preferential attachment model. And in these two cases, you see an increase in the levels of cooperation observed. These are networks growing from a seed population of three cooperators. These are networks growing from a seed population of three defectors. How are you at the time? Um, you have about six minutes. Oh, that's right. 
So, um, so this um, this fluctuation model actually is high level cooperation. It has all the advantages, all the, you know, it has all the features with which I've mentioned. Now, I could be accused of comparing apples and pears here because I'm comparing a devolutionary preferential attachment model without fluctuation to a different type of model with fluctuation. So I'll now show you the fuller picture, which um, shows EPA, e sorry, evolutionary preferential attachment, evolutionary preferential attachment with fluctuation bolted onto it, and then my model without fluctuation. And you can see that scale-free distributions give you higher levels of cooperation than, than random attachment, which is not surprising and is in keeping with the rest of the literature. And you can also see that fluctuation promotes cooperation, which I've illustrated by these arrows. So when the solid line goes to the dashed line, that's the addition of the fluctuation component. So you can see that in all cases there's an increase. So um, that's pretty much it. We've, uh, we've developed this model. Uh, the model is fluctuation, and it uses a simple mechanism of random attachment. We've shown that it supports cooperation. And the interesting things about it are it is robust to starting conditions. So it supports cooperation regardless of whether the population grows from cooperators or defectors. It's effective on networks growing from founder populations. It's also effective on pre-existing networks. So you could have a network populated entirely by defectors. It could be a random structure. And this model would uh, result in a cooperative network of a, probably an exponential distribution. Um, it's also important to note that by replacing preferential attachment with random attachment, and we've now eliminated the requirements for the agents to have any kind of global knowledge within the population. So that's that's what I wanted to say. I, I, because I was concerned about time, I put this at the end. I thought it might be useful just to say something about cooperation, why why you need to understand it. So Charles Darwin was particularly concerned about it in whenever it was the mid 1800s because he thought it was going to scuttle the whole theory of evolution. He knew that in a nation of Victorians who were obsessed with keeping bees, they fully understood uh, altruism or cooperative behaviour in insects. The ideas of Lynn Mardu with symbiogenesis and, and the symbiosis, uh, that, the idea of cooperation and competition goes hand in hand with that, and it's been argued that cooperation is essential to increase complexity in evolution. Cooperation is ubiquitous throughout the natural world, and we don't have a full understanding of it. The ability to cooperate will be really important for the human race in facing future challenges. And just moving back down to Earth, um, this, is a, this is an approach which clearly works in nature, and it's very effective at solving, compl at creating complex solutions to, to problems posed by the environment. So I, I just wonder if we shouldn't be making better use of that, and introducing that idea in, in things like evolutionary techniques. I've not seen many examples of it. There seems to be a group being ad hoc wireless networks that are looking at it and a few other things around. So uh, that, that's my talk. Thank you very much.